My name is Freya Jeffcott and I'm currently a researcher and a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, part of the Disease Dynamics Unit. I look at kind of cross-disciplinary approaches to understanding um, zoonotic emergence and response systems. So that's uh, diseases that jump from animals into human populations. I recently got back from Sierra Leone where I was working as a field epidemiologist with one of the big international NGOs. My specific area was a district in the north of Sierra Leone that had been really, really badly hit by Ebola um, midway through 2014. But by the time I got there, it was very much winding down. And it was a sort of case of working out what to do next, how to manage, how to stop it really kicking off there again. So looking at good surveillance systems and pursuing the final rumours of the last few cases here and there. Uh, I guess this was my first sort of big international response to an outbreak. So there are a lot of agencies in quite a confined space and you have the sort of domestic disease control officers, so the district surveillance officers, and these are Sierra Leoneans who have been responsible for the health of this population like before the Ebola outbreak all the way through it and will be once it's over. Uh, one of the big problems is that the way that the Ebola response was going on in these areas with all these different international organisations was that they sort of fractured the response. They each took different aspects. So, for example, the surveillance system, which in this sort of winding down district was so crucial, it's not that straightforward. So it does involve a safe burial. It does involve like swabbing. It does involve somebody notifying you that someone has died in these quite remote areas. Uh, it has a lot of different like components and it does involve the district surveillance officers sort of coordinating all of these things. The way that it worked in this area is that the different international organisations took responsibility for different aspects of this. So the safe burial was being coordinated by the Red Cross. Uh, the testing was being done by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. WHO was advising and supporting the district surveillance officers as was Doctors Without Borders, MSF. Then you had uh, UNDP supporting the sort of community-based surveillance people that were meant to flag when someone in their community had died. So this sort of fractured response was just absolutely exhausting to these district surveillance officers that had already been through so much and already had so much on-the-ground experience handling this to have all these fresh faces then try and not only come to grips with what the system was... There is a sort of approach to these international responses where we treat them as so exceptional as to, and it's such a risk to the population in general, uh, whether they really are or not. They're just so sensationalised that they sort of justify this real interventionist and sudden and aggressive approach that sort of says um, nothing else matters except for doing this and doing it hard. And that's really not the approach to take. For a lot of areas... It is an emergency situation, but it's also a sort of feature of this landscape in the long term. Geographically, socioeconomically, there are a lot of factors that lead it to be susceptible to these kinds of events, uh, which suggests that the people that actually live in these areas are the ones you should be supporting long term to be able to handle these sorts of events. My name's Annie Wilkinson. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Development Studies, and I have been involved in working on the Ebola epidemic in West Africa this last year. So it's been an interesting experience, actually, seeing how the response works. And first of all, I guess it's it's not particularly accurate to talk a bit about the response. There's actually multiple different people involved, and they don't necessarily see eye to eye. So myself and colleagues have been asked at various points to give advice about anthropological aspects um, of particular problems. And... There were these two or three occasions where they asked for help and then basically said, actually, no, we can't do that now. We don't have enough time. It's too much of an emergency. And so those aspects of programmes or responses quite often seem to get dropped in terms of, as it was a health emergency, what seems to often get prioritised is the 
things like building beds in hospitals and sending doctors. And that's all clearly things that do need to happen, but actually uh, in a disease which is spread by social relations and social networks are, are fundamental to um, turning the epidemic curve around. Building beds in hospitals are easier to count, easier to report, easier to kind of make a case that you're doing something. But actually, there's a real case to be made, I think, for bringing in communities to develop kind of their own approaches to, you know, specific problems that they are facing. 